Sterling Lanier believed in Frank Herbert's doom. When Lanier first read Herbert's epic tale about noble houses, intergalactic space merchants, assassins, and prophecies, it hadn't made it to novels yet. Sterling found it in a sci-fi magazine called Analog, published back in 1965, and he loved it. Sterling wasn't publishing. He was a sci-fi writer too, albeit a relative unknown. And he was so enamored with Frank Herbert's book, he made an offer for the full manuscript. Sterling was willing to overlook the fact that 20 other publishers had passed on it because it was written by a sand dunes researcher and most readers couldn't seem to get past the first 100 pages. Dune was convoluted in parts. It slowed down, almost intentionally in others. And the final book was over 200,000 words. In a time when most sci-fi novels were 60,000 words and 80,000 words would have been considered overblown and long. But Sterling was a true believer. He loved fantasy. He loved sci-fi. Dune was the peanut butter chocolate combination of both genres, putting Duke's Baron's prophecies and magic powers alongside laser guns, shields, and faster than light travel. Dune had everything. And Sterling Lanier dearly wanted to use his publishing house to do what 20 other publishers refused to do. He wanted to put Dune on store shelves. There was just one problem. The publishing house Sterling worked for was Chilton as in Chilton car repair manuals. Chilton's were as thick as phone books, and they were usually titled after the car was written to repair. Owned a 1970s Cadillac, there was a Cadillac Chilton with detailed instructions on how to take apart and rebuild any caddy between 1967 and 1989, down to the last lug nut. Sterling published car manuals, Chilton's, not fantasy novels. Having Chilton publish a fantasy was like asking a FOMA company to pump out a few Harry Potter novels. Publishing Frank Herbert's book, Dune, would have been an incredible career risk for Sterling. So what is a devoted fantasy reader to do? If you guess that Sterling took his career risk and published it anyway, you're damn right he did. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then, we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Lametz, The Extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no on the internet and get to the facts. It's official. Major news sources are calling this year the Great Resignation. More Americans have quit their jobs during the pandemic than any other time in history. Just last August, 2.9% of the entire workforce walked out on their jobs. So today, we want to talk about taking career risks. If we're in a comfortable job with good benefits and a decent compensation, when is it okay to push our chips in? Should we take risks when we're young and our careers can bounce back or near the end when we're financially secure? And if our riskiness gets us canned, how do we put getting fired on our next resume? To answer our employment questions, we have three myths to bust. Myths like, myth one, if we're secure in our job and the benefits are good, why not lay low? As the Japanese say, the nail that sticks out gets hammered. Myth two, okay, the writing's on the wall, the ship's going down, people are clearing out their desks. Who do we reach out to for our next career? Do we go to friends in similar fields? Our family, headhunters. Myth three, so you got fired. That's the worst thing you can put on your resume, right? You might as well say you left a path of wreckage at every job you've worked. We're going to bust these myths and more. But first, I want to tell Joe how Sterling Lanier tried his hand at writing before he became a sci-fi mega fan. So, it's been my experience just by knowing a lot of nerds when somebody is so, so into fantasy and sci-fi like this, they have usually tried it. Like, they they have at some point tried to be a writer. Um, Sterling, working in publishing, obviously he had put his pen to paper at some point. So, uh, what did what did he write? How come 
How come we've never heard you and I of Sterling? Well, I think he was working for the Chilton to pay the bills, right? Yeah. But he had visions of being a best-selling author. He, he wrote a few novels. Um, he was a published author. A couple of the names. The War of the, for the Lot. Menace Under Marshwood were the names. And he had some short stories with kind of some goofy names. Um, a Feminine jurisdic- di- Jurisdiction. Um, such Stuff as Dreams. These are all short stories. Who's Short Happy Life? Thinking the unthinkable. And my personal favorite, the voice of the turtle. <laughs> the voice of the turtle. <laughs> now, why that didn't sell, the voice of the turtle, is beyond me. That sounds like a Pixar short. Like, that, that sounds very cuddly. <laughs> now, you might wonder how this Frank Herbert got into the dunes, right? Right. Um, he began re- researching Dune. Not the book, not it wasn't a story. He got a, he got assigned it as a work assignment, and he was studying the dunes in Oregon. It's called in Florence, Oregon. Have you been to the dunes in Florence? It's I have. They're they're big and windswept, and they're they're quite an iconic piece of the landscape. I've gone there quadded. It's really fun. It's amazing. And he overstudied. He got so involved in this, over involved in this. He geeked out. He had so much material for this one little article, Joe. It was unpublishable. It was too <laughs> thick. No, <laughs> no editor, no reader would have been able to digest it. Okay, so he was already we're off into unpublishable territory. He starts out publishing or or intending to publish a short article. So he had this big, and this is probably good, just you being a creative writer yourself, this is a good rule of how you work, right? You get so much chunk of content, so much information, you study it, and then you you slice it out, you thin it out, you floss it out. That is something, to, to not take us on too heavy of a cav, uh, caveat about changing career tracks and changing interests, that is a misconception about fantasy writers is that they're really good at fantasy. Oftentimes, the best fantasy writers are actually good at history or science. Like George R. R. Martin studied, you know, the Yorks versus the, what was it, the, the War of the Roses, basically. Um, he studied history. Good to hear that Frank Herbert was looking at sand. I mean, not to say that's boring, but kind of sounds a little bit boring. You have to be a patient man, right? Right. To understand millions and hundreds of millions of years. I think um, Sterling Lander's background is kind of interesting to me, too. Um, he, he went to, he was trained, um, educated at Harvard. So he's an Ivy League guy, anthropologist and archaeologist. Oh, wow. So you can see why he would have been attracted to Dune. Okay. But that doesn't seem like a guy, that's a science guy, not a fiction guy, not a fantasy guy, right? Right, that doesn't strike me as, I, I mean, both of those would really lend themselves well to fantasy, but that doesn't sound like, um, what do you call it, that doesn't sound like George R. R. Martin material. And to your point, Joe, he worked as a research historian for a museum for two full years. Wow. So we've got a meeting of... When Frank Herbert wrote about something that is dry and boring as Dunes, he was speaking to to Linear. Now, Dune didn't come in a book form. It was chunked up in different fragments in different magazines. And Frank Herbert, the author, was saying that someday this is going to be a salable property. Okay. So says Frank about having it be a salable property, but... 20 publishers disagreed with him, right? Yeah, 20 publishers know what they're doing. I always think of those guys later fighting, throwing books at each other, you know, saying, you passed on Dune. (laughs) Right. (laughs) The blame game, right? I, for a long time, I thought publishers were be were above that 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 they wouldn't be regretful that they passed on major properties where they're just like oh you know i overlooked one but that's the business that is not true i have heard them trash talk each other oh so, really yeah um uh, one of the guys that greenlit um harry potter for scholastic has gone on record to be like yeah those publishers who didn't pay attention to jk rowling they should be fired all of them so (laughs) these guys yeah they do have those kind of regrets so those 20 publishers that aren't publishing frank herbert 
back in the 60s they must have just been eating their hat like it must have been bad well and i think it, it wasn't all the way done and that's the thing it kind of evolved and that's important thing this is a this is a quote that i thought was funny about book one number one for dune mm-hmm. i'm gonna read this quote to you nobody seemed to be able to get through the first hundred pages without being confused and irritated <laughs> <laughs> so this book was so bad. It's not like you just lost interest. You got started to get pissed off. Right. So Frank is banging on doors, picking up phones, cold calling, not getting any interest. He gets his big break. The sci-fi magazine analog printed his st- short story. Um, Lanier, Sterling Lanier reads it, loses his mind, changes his life. For anyone that doesn't know as far as sci-fi goes analog they're the top as far as like prestige magazines go so this has got to be a tough sell so he's a publisher smart guy ivy league guy he's geeking out on this story he goes to his work and says i want to do this non-tech motor (laughs) general motors ford uh, automobile repair manuals and let's do a fictional book that nobody else wants oh my god i'm can i imagine that the board at Chilton is just like a bunch of auto repair guys in coveralls and that Sterling is pitching this to a board of like hard nosed, you know, quiet guys. Are you reading my mind? I could just see them. They just changed the brakes on their car before they got there. Right. They've, they're rubbing the oil off their hands and they're just like quietly listening to this nerd. So Sterling Lanier wins. He talks his publishing company into publishing Dune as a book. And it's headed out for bookstores. It's 412 pages. It's thick. It's dense. It's $5.95, which is a lot at the time. The problem is it was too dense. The cost of um, putting the book, publishing it, because it was so many pages, was way expensive. And they didn't have experience in this. And on top of all that, Joe, the book didn't sell. Okay. So... Lanier's out of his depth. They have just dropped a a, a doorstop of a book. There's a uh, when I okay. So when tell me your opinion. But when I get into big novels, the ones that are really thick, really dense, hard to get through, I I expect that they are going to overcome my hesitancy at how dense it is by drawing me in. That just it's going to be easy. Just being such a good story. Right. It's this seems like it was overly thick and the first hundred pages were just a challenge. Like scale this mountain. Like it's reading that textbook. Right. Um yeah, I I don't think I could think of a better example of somebody taking a massive career risk than Sterling. Like <laughs> I feel like all the other examples we have in today's episode are like so small by comparison because <laughs> everything else. Okay. So what's the, the biggest career risk you have taken? Oh, I've, I've gone from auto finance, a corporate job to starting my own construction company. Okay. So switching career tracks is a huge risk. Um, what about we're you? also, hmm? what about you? Well, I, I've done things, um, it, we're going to talk the risk of switching career tracks. We're also going to talk about my type of risk, which is you're in a company for a long time, you get a little comfortable, and then you do risky things out of boredom or just because you, you would like to be paid more or recognized more. Um, my career risk was um, recently I spoke to, we had a, a visiting regional manager who was several uh, heads above me and when he asked my opinion on things as far as like why we're losing people uh, you know why we're not retaining employees I was very outspoken um, I told him why we lost people w- what they had been paid what the people around us were paying for our job so it, it was it was a risk for me to potentially piss off people directly above me and if you hadn't been there for as long as you were your tenure and respected, you probably would have kept that to yourself. Do you ever feel like when you're telling the boss this stuff, say some of this stuff should be fairly obvious? Yeah, it, it's it, uh, the way I explained it is I was like, you know, this I can get why 
you wouldn't have covered this in a board meeting. I'm sure it came up, but this is everything we think about. Like, like for you guys, um, you know, what you pay as compared to the other sites, that is a consideration to your bottom line. And it's something that you generally think about nebulously for us, you know, in, in the office, that's what we think about every day. We're checking glass door every day because, you know, the, we're living through a pandemic and that is the risk we're taking. Um, if, if any employer out there listening to this uh, thinks that your millennial age employees aren't thinking of jumping ship, all of them are all of the time. Um, something we're going to discuss in this episode is there's a reason why company loyalty doesn't exist anymore. And it is because we are expected to work 12 to 14 different jobs throughout our lifetime. It would be foolish as far as a time and commitment on our part to have company loyalty. So we strictly get paid for our work. We strictly put in what we get paid for effectively. Um, So when you are thinking about taking a risk like Sterling Linear, Sterling might have been thinking... Uh, I've got a lot of loyalty to Chilton. Chilton has paid my bills. But in the end, his real passion was for fiction. It was for this book. And he saw an opportunity to push his passion above his job and above his station. And I, I respect the hell out of that. Um, so I have a question. When, when you take career risks, were you, were you younger or older when you took those risks? I was younger. Okay. I was braver when I was younger. Some would say foolish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ambitious to the point of foolish. And if you gave me an idea, I, I will actually follow through with it. I probably do more follow through than I do actually thinking if I should do it. <laughs> somebody, somebody dares you to walk out the door and you're already out. <laughs> you get more scared of that stuff as you get older. I'm 47 and I, I got the, the stakes are higher now. I have more to lose. Yeah. I remember reading long ago, um, the older we get, the more likely we are to act risk averse in our careers to the point where people are more likely to be Republican when they grow older because they will become so risk averse they change um, tribes uh, politically. Um, You get that fear of loss more. Yeah. You know, the fear of getting hurt. I think you're even afraid of, I think a lot of people are afraid to start a new job of just where to park and have to meet new people and new skills you think oh that'd be exciting to learn new things and people are petrified terrified it feels like school where you gotta learn where your locker room is and (laughs) what classes you gotta get to people get comfortable being comfortable i was reading uh harvard business review to to get answers about this exact subject you switching from you know sales to owning a company to you know what you're doing now Half of Americans are uh, doing that right now. Um, According to this HBR article, which we'll link to, it says half of all Americans long to do something dramatically different with their work lives uh, to the point where they are pursuing new classes, new careers. Um, The the myth that everybody is just copping out and being lazy in the the, uh, great uh, walkout that we're going through, it's not true at all. There are record numbers of people getting recertifications, getting new licenses, getting new classes under their belt. Um, Everybody is treating this moratorium like a free card to reassign what their career trajectory is. Um, We're also kind of wired to, like you said, resist giving up the known for the unknown. Um, So what is something you do personally if you can... Um, sh- share some wisdom or impart some wisdom. Uh, what is something you feel comfortable gambling on when you switch careers? I feel comfortable gambling. I, I guess you would say on myself. I think that in sales, if I if I have a product that is priced competitively, and I'm willing to believe in it, I think I could sell that. I think I could earn a living doing that. Okay, that is a good leg to stand on. Um, <clears throat> they have some uh, data in here by headhunters and they talk about how um, when people switch careers one of the mistakes they make is they go with a career a new career that is too similar to their old one so they, they kind of do the math you just did where they think of 
here's what I'm good at, here's here's what I will apply my skills to, and they end up in a job that is basically just one tone darker, lighter than what they started with. Um, according to this article, uh, they talk about how the majority of people we know, uh, they can really only imagine tell themselves in one line of work. So one of the more important parts of uh, getting into a new career is going to your network, um, not your friends, because I, I make a lot of friends who do the same job as I do. Like like most of my friends are either from public speaking or they are from my work. It's better to reach out to your extended network, those, you know, friends of friends, associates, people you've talked to at, at you know, parties and things. Um, the folks who are doing drastically different jobs, just ask them, you know, what do you do? What, what, what is your job? This falls into self-promotion, Joe, and right now I've been working, I guess you'd say mentoring a couple of my friends who are reaching out to people on LinkedIn. And we're getting scripts and we're writing word tracks and we're reaching out to strangers. And these are engineers. They're not comfortable doing that. But me as a salesperson, I am. So we combine their tech and a little bit of my sales and we say, hey, my name's Joe Anthony. This is my experience. This is what I want to do. Can you help me? Right. And there's no shame in going to a headhunter or going to somebody. I mean, even if, even if we just find a Todd, somebody who can direct us to a job that is something that is probably in our skill set, but not in our thoughts. Um, you know, so you, you don't necessarily have to find a quote unquote headhunter. You can just find the friend who has good ideas on what you'd be capable of. We covered another episode that oftentimes friends are better able to gauge whether or not we'll complete a task than we are. That was a great study we covered, and it has colored this whole episode for me. Now I just want to go to all my friends and be like, hey, what do you think I can do? And your coworkers know what kind of worker you really are. Exactly. More than you do. Exactly. They, they oftentimes do. If you want to start looking into a new career entirely, try to get a weekend uh, visit or, or try to volunteer or, or try to get involved in another career in some way. So you at least learn what the, the work looks like from the inside, because you jumping to another career is all fantasy until you see what it's like. And you realize, like, have you had that moment where you meet somebody and you idolize their career until you you meet them, and you're like, "Oh my God, I could do that." Exactly. And they make all this money, and they right. don't do anything. You ever have that one too? They Absolutely. Don't even do anything, and they make all this money. Yes, I, I've I've had a couple of careers that I put on pedestals, and I thought those were you know uh, men and women who were you know it must be geniuses or titans or they must have skills that go deep. And I met them, and I was like, "Oh, I could do your job." Well, I'm embarrassed by a couple of them, and pandemic has really brought these professions to light, would be nurses and, and doctors. Yeah. And I knew they were very educated, and they cared for people. I didn't realize the stress that they have from patients and from disease and just from just work their bodies to death. Some of them are ruining their, their physical and mental health. Absolutely. If they had gone and shadowed a nurse or doctor before they even applied to medical school, they may not have done it. They, they may have just said, there's no way I can do that for 10 years or whatever. Um, so that is our, our advice we're taking away from this article. If you, like half of all Americans, are thinking about changing your careers right now, um, skip doing expensive classes. Skip uh, you know beating your head against resume walls. Go shadow somebody or, or volunteer or if you can get a, a at least get a tour of somebody's facilities. See if you can get time in on the inside just to tell yourself, A, this is something I want to do. It's not like nursing. I won't be sick of this soon. And B, I'm capable of this. I just need to take a couple classes and this is totally something I'd have. So I have a quick question for you. Uh, would you consider the studio a safe space? Can I share things? Yes. I, I'm going to regret this because you do say some weird shit sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard part about being the closer we get, the more weird shit we come up with. The strange comes out. Uh, I found out 
uh, Lanier and I share something in common. We have a hobby. Have you ever seen um, game miniatures or game figurines? I have. And I know you've done painted some, right? I'm, I think I, I think you shared with me a little bit about this. Exactly. I don't okay. know anything about them. Well, you already know my dark secret, apparently. Um <laughs> When you play uh, a game of Dungeons and Dragons or a fantasy tabletop game of whatever, they've got these tiny action figures that are like, they're just little sculptures and they're going to be like a dwarf or a wizard or a fighter or something, a little guy holding a sword. And they are um, 30 millimeters tall. They are they're about an inch and some change tall. And you push those around on a board and that's how you determine where you're standing during a fight. Lanier makes those, or at least he used to. Um, and he was such an emphatic miniatures maker, like sculptor. He had some of them at display at the Smithsonian, and he made a Gandalf and um, Hobbit figurines and dwarf figurines that were, in his reckoning, so good, he sent them to uh, J.R. Tolkien, the guy that oh. wrote Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Oh wow! So he was—he had to be in that kind of museum. It must have been good. Yeah, I looked at him. Um, compared to the miniatures that you can buy online now, they're not that great. But back in the '60s, those must have been amazing because they're very, very detailed. And Tolkien apparently liked him. Like he—he he sent him letters back and said, "Congrats on the miniatures. Please don't market those." Like he basically said, "They're really, really good." Uh, please don't mass market those that, you know, that's not really what my property is intended for, but I will sue I like you. Him. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't know, right. To take those now and turn them into toys and <laughs> exactly. make a few more million, million dollars. The, the subtle undertone was if you sell these, I swear to God, uh, no, um, Tolkien was very cool about it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just researching this story, I thought it was so neat that Lanier is a to-the-blood super fan, yeah. sci-fi fantasy nerd, and I just like that so much. I do, too. I think that's so cool that the he that truly is his passion. Yeah. That this Harvard scientist yes. <laughs> does figurines about it because it's just it's his true love. This Harvard grad who is working at Chilton's, a secure job publishing manuals, and he's like secretly pulling for... Herbert, which I think is awesome. And Lanier, he got his way. So he got Chilton. They actually published a couple of fiction books. They bought um, a trade publisher called Greenberg. And since Greenberg was going to be their fiction, and that they did The Riches Cross in 1966, and their big hit was, of course, Dune. Okay. And then Dune obviously won awards and made them a lot of money eventually. Something I wanted to tell you about um, Herbert, who wrote the book. Um, the book, Joe, took six years of just research. Wow. <laughs> so, as a writer, and you've written some books, some that will be published soon, um, that that's telling, isn't it? That's a lot. I mean, I know if you go out to write a book, um, I, I think I'm going to hearken to uh, what Brandon Sanderson, uh, writer of the Mistborn series, says. You don't want to construct an iceberg. You want to make an, a hollow iceberg. You don't learn absolutely everything about dunes. You learn enough to look like you know what you're doing when you start writing about characters who actually know. So it looks like he constructed a dune. Like It sounds like he really went whole hog. Well, and to do that, he had some family support. It doesn't pay well to research a fantasy Dune book for six years, right? What does that pay? Nothing? <laughs> yeah, I think it's free. His wife believed in him. His wife was a breadwinner. Said, you focus on this. I don't know if she was happy about it or not. I could find any research <laughs> on that. But isn't that great? That is awesome that he had the support that he needed to do this. So now I guess you guys, so let's go back to our publisher, our fantasy or sci-fi fan, but he's a Linear. big time book publisher. He he was a brilliant man. He saw th saw something that no one else saw. Joe, right. Dune. Every, the whole world's gonna love this. The first year, it didn't sell. Guess what happened to Stern and Lanier? Being that he took such a huge risk on behalf of his company, uh, I'm guessing these hard nosed mechanics people were uh, patient and willing to let him have another swing. 
because of the high publication costs and the poor initial sales, he was dismissed from Chilton in, after only one year okay. after June came out. <laughs> I'm surprised he wasn't fired the moment he started publishing. I mean, like, in my childish brain, he is like, they're supposed to be making a Chevrolet manual, and he's in the back like, one second, and he's just like pulling the lever, making a machine print out, you know, fantasy books for as long as he can. I can just see him scrambling, like, he has to report to the board, and he's just praying. He can't sleep. I mean, he must have been stressed out, because the book's oh, just not selling. God, he's I out promoting think about it that. every day. He's on the phone with Herbert, right? Like, dude, we gotta make something happen, man. He's got to report to these repair manual people, like these, yeah, these old-fashioned salty earth guys that his fantasy isn't selling. Oh, that would be heartbreaking. <sighs> Unfortunately, Sterling Lanier gets fired for um, following his his passion. Um, do you want to talk about what happens in real life when when th- th- this is real life? But when we get fired because we take a risk, how do we bounce back? Yeah. Okay, so you don't have to share this if you don't want to, but have you ever been fired from a job, and did you report it to your next job? Well, it's funny you say that, because as a young man, I used to always brag about two things. One, that a woman never left me, and two, that I'd never been fired from a job. The second I started bragging about it, it started happening over and over again. <laughs> Both. <laughs> so firing comes in, uh, it comes in twos, threes, and whatever, and... When I was young, I would have I would have passed a lie detector test saying that I quit. I would have lied about being fired and say I didn't get fired. I left. Okay. Would it shock you to know that um, based on topresume.com, um, it actually looks worse on your resume if you quit voluntarily versus getting fired? Really? I think the exact opposite. Being fired looks bad leaving without a good reason looks worse because that shows that you are not needy enough to need that job that you're not you know uh stapled to that paycheck they're giving you it's flaky right (laughs) right it's it's looked at as either flaky or they know that you have enough income independently that you don't actually need to put up with their garbage um so yeah let's let's go through the motions let's um let's start an interview uh, I will interview for the re-engineered you. I hope you hire me. Um, and let's talk about what it looks like if I've been fired. And by the way, I'm not going to pretend that I was fired for a sterling linear level. You know, I, I risked everything for my passion. Uh, let's just go with boring old. I was caught sleeping on the job. I wasn't making sales. I, I wasn't pulling my weight. I, I spoke out at the wrong time during, you know, a, a meeting or something. So if you are a hiring manager and I tell you I got fired, what would your first question be? Why? Exactly. (laughs) Why would I get fired? The first off will say, you do not have to put being fired on your resume. So when I turned in my resume here at the podcast (laughs) fictionally, this is all in fantasy, by the way, um, I don't put that on my resume. I just put when I started, when it ended. It will come up. The question will happen. People want to know why you have a gap. Um, But when you ask why I got fired, I will be honest. Um, That is the number one uh, piece of advice that this website gives us. We'll have links to it. And all the websites I looked at uh, that talked about how to recover from being fired, they all said the same thing. Be honest. You do not want to uh, paper over or try to make it look like there's no gap in your resume. You don't want to pretend you weren't fired. You don't even want to lie and say that, you know, uh, I quit. Or, um, you know, it was a disagreement about policy. The second you start to get muddy with it, everyone's going to know that you're lying. Exactly. Truth These is are, just easier to remember. <laughs> yeah. As as somebody who has hired people, or at least you've been in on the process, can you sniff it out when somebody's lying about being fired? Yes, and then they go down that... A lot of times they they make the, it worse by trying to say the boss didn't like me. It wasn't right. fair. They, they make their they dig their hole deeper. Yeah, they give the the tried and true lie, which is uh, I did the work of several people. Somebody just didn't like me. Um, 
Instead, we want to give you a different tool. We want to give you the tool that is honest and will look really good, which is, first off, when you say why you were fired, be succinct and to the point. Um, if the reason had nothing to do with you, if it really was downsizing layoffs or the boss got rid of your whole team, that's fine. That's perfect. Just say that. Um, but if it had something to do with you personally, do not badmouth your past employer because the person hiring you does not want to hear that you're going to put it on your higher ups. If you do something wrong, they want to hear you being responsible and they want to hear you learning and being, you know, willing to pull your weight even after being fired. So simply state what you learned, how you benefited from the negative experience and what you intend to turn it into a positive in the future, what you're going to do to, to make it a learning experience. You don't have to elaborate further. After you say that, after you say, you know, uh, my team put in a lot of work. Uh, I learned what it looks like when, you know, a, a team faces hard times. Um, I'm, it, even though I am no longer working with them, I like what we accomplished. And if you stop there, beautiful. You, you will look golden compared to everybody else who has come in and lied and said, the boss hated me because I worked too hard. The, yeah, the one I hear a lot, the two of them in the sales game is, I did my, I did all, I did my boss's job. Right. Well, that's why they hired you. Of course, they hired you to do work, right? Right. <laughs> and that's someone who doesn't really know what their boss really does. Right. Exactly. A avoid using the word fired. Just don't dwell on the negatives. Highlight the silver linings. Don't lie, and you'll be perfect. Um, the big thing to remember is lots of people have been uh, fired, especially during COVID. I mean, we're every hiring manager is going to you know shake hands with so many people who have been fired during this time. It is not a deal breaker. Uh, what is a deal breaker? Negativity and somebody who doesn't learn from the experience. So, Todd, if I were going to say that uh, I learned something from uh, my mistakes, uh, the last podcast that I left in a smoking rubble, I learned a lot from that experience. And I won't do that here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know what not to do. <laughs> I know what not to do, right. So, can we talk a little bit about, speaking of silver linings, um, I would say, I don't know this for sure, but Sterling Lanier whatever publisher he went to next, I would be so proud of getting fired for the reason he did. Like getting fired over Dune is like getting fired because you found a gold chest in the desert. Well, that's what I was wondering. Did Chilton call him back and apologize and say, hey. They must have. They must have at some point. Well, this was this was the money. We like to talk about money, right? Because we can measure money. Right. Um, the advance that... The writer Herbert got for Dune was seventy five hundred dollars. Okay, so nineteen sixty nine. That's only about fifty six thousand dollars in today's money. So but, that's a that's a pretty darn good advance for a, a new writer. Mm -hmm. um, new writers, even in today's money, only make about five grand for a new book um, for their first time out. So that's really good for Herbert then. But if I mean, if you already knew Dune was such a massive hit because the you know the magazine analog, uh, that that's still not quite six. That doesn't justify quite six years of hard research. I think. Yeah, and maybe if those other um, those twenty publishers that turned it down, if it wasn't for Sterling, maybe it wouldn't have even made it. Maybe that was one of the reasons. Right. He yeah. How much how much failed did Herbert have in him? How many of those rejections could he have gotten before he said? I'm a sand dunes researcher. I should have never done this. And I have a feeling that Sterling pounded on a lot of doors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One, trying to save his job, and two, because he really believed in it. But Herbert and Sterling Ladeer were right. Dune goes on to sell 20 million copies, and it's been translated in dozens of languages. And the movie that's out right now just made $147 million. If I am Sterling Lanier and I go to a job interview after being fired from Chilton, the only thing my job interview says is 20 million copies in big, bold letters, nothing else, <laughs> maybe my name at the bottom. 
So just to ask you, just to sort of bring us full circle, are you going to see the new Dune movie? After this episode, yes. Um, and I'm going to talk the ear off of whoever's sitting next to me and see if they want to know the history <laughs> of the story. Hey, do you know how Dune got sold? Um, did we already talk about the uh, the joke Frank Herbert made about uh, what they were going to call his book? Okay. <laughs> so uh, Frank Herbert hears that Chilton, a repair manual company, is about to publish his book. What do you think they were going to call his book? What? How do you repair your ornithopter? Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) Opinions on when to take big career risk differ person to person. Some say it's best to act risky when you're young. After all, it's no biggie if you get fired in your 20s or 30s. Others say your heart will be your guide, like Sterling Lanier. You'll know when it's time to put your reputation in line for something you believe in, like true love. You'll know it when you see it, and you'll fight to the death for it. Whether that's hiring an unpopular candidate you like, championing a project everyone wants to pass on, or publishing a sci-fi novel at your auto repair press. Here's the important part. Whatever risk you take, Whether it's jumping into a new career or coming back from a round of layoffs, take risks, be positive, and highlight what you've learned. The average person is expected to hold 13 different jobs throughout their life, which means the average hiring manager will shake a lot of hands, many of whom have been fired. Want to know what will set you apart from the other people who have been canned? You'll have passion and positivity on your side like Sterling Lanier. You've been listening to The Re-Engineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredyou.com where we have research links, show notes, and blog articles for each of our episodes. We also love feedback, and we love spirited debates, like uh, why Jodorowsky's Dune would have been better than the new Dune, so come fight me. We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything.